Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about conscious machines. We have Dr. Yosha Bach joining us on the show. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for coming on, really appreciate it. I'm super excited for this episode. This is gonna be a really good one, guys. Dr. Yosha Bach is VP of Research at AI Foundation and author of Principles of Synthetic Intelligence. He's focused on how our minds work and how to build machines that can perceive think and learn. And you can find the links below in the bio to bach.ai, B-A-C-H.ai, as well as his LinkedIn and Twitter profiles. All right, Yosha, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think we are right now at, at the top of the, our world. We are at the best possible position to be born into. Imagine that you have the choice of being born into a sustainable, sane world that is an agricultural society, 300 million people tops, no internet, no long range transportation, um, no interesting educational system and so on, right? Or you can be in an insane world, a world that has just burned 100 million years worth of trees in a single century to give everybody plumbing and access to the world's knowledge as an afterthought to a global uh, chat room to, for porn distribution, basically the internet, right? And this is the thing that we have right now. It's an insane world. Right, it's a world in which we have computers, in which we can travel anywhere, where we can talk to seven and a half billion people that are often very smart and interesting. And we are in the first time in history on this planet of any life form, I think, in a situation that we can meaningfully reflect the universe. This is a really amazing time to be alive. It's really the best time to be alive. So in some sense, you could see life on Earth as this entropic puddle that is more or less sustainable for a while, I mean, one and a half billion years, then the atmosphere will be gone and uh, life on Earth in its current form will cease to exist. And a few billion years later, the sun will engulf the planet. And I don't think that there will be a meaningful export of life from this planet in, in an intelligent form, but might be, who knows? Probably not our species though. We are the first ones that basically made this very short game to jump out of this puddle as high as we can. And we are right now, I think, at the top of this parabola. And from here, of course, it will go down again. So people look down and they freak out. They realize basically we can't deliver ourselves over an entropic abyss and there is no land on the other side. Right? When we come down, it will not be gentle. But it was never nice down there to begin with. Right? You don't want to be down there. You want to have a few generations up here if you, your goal is to understand what's going on in the universe. And um, if that is not your preference, if you want to have a sustainable world, well, bad luck, you didn't get to make the choice. Th these decisions were made long ago. I think the last important bifurcation that we had was when we opted in for the Industrial Revolution. And there was not much that we could change that train on that we are currently in. And I'm very much in favor of trying to make a longer game and make it more sustainable. But it's quite likely that we are unable to, to return to s a sustainable state or that we are able to make the present growth-oriented, cancerous world sustainable, right? But uh, yeah. You can look at this, oh my god, I'm so depressed because the world is going to go down from here. Or you can see it's never been that high up, right? And we wouldn't be talking if we wouldn't be in this giant Titanic that is heading for the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent synthesis. I do want to know how you know that we are at the top of the parabola and not how, the, how we're not just going to continue going up on like a y equals x, just keep going up. So uh, typically when you look at the way uh, things happen, right? If you see some kind of growth, and if you zoom out a little bit, you see that it uh, is usually part of an S-curve that hits a, a saturation point, right? Okay. And if you zoom out even further, you see that this is going to come down, you, uh, because everything that comes up tends to come down again at some point. And the question is where you are right now, and people tend to extrapolate from the current direction of the curve, and not from the logical dynamics of the overall curve. And uh, when it becomes apparent that things are flattening out or uh, things might be going down, people go into denial because they get invested in the present state of affairs which looks like it's going up. We can arguably say that over the last several million years that we've been following an S-curve in terms of amount of people, amount of intelligence, like you said, access to the wealth of knowledge on the internet, all these great things, longevity. But why is it all of a sudden going to go from this up in the S-curve to a down? I think that for the last uh, few million years, uh, if you take this perspective, there was mostly not many humans around, right? After um, the Mount Toga eruption, there were a few 
by population bottleneck was I think 7,000 people or so. Not that many uh, ancestors uh, that we depend on. There were probably more people there, but those people that were successful and replaced everybody was a small group back then. And then we were um, for a long time about a million people, a million human beings roaming the planet. And then we invented agricultural societies and probably religions to organize them and so on. And this got us to um, something like 100 million people. And uh, at the turn of the times, uh, when we had switched to monotheistic religions, we were at something like 300 million people. And we stayed there for a long time. There were little uh, growths and dips if we had a war or uh, some famine or um, um, a big uh, disease and a pandemic. And then uh, basically at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were still at something like 400 million. And all the Industrial Revolution got us to billions of people, the modernist societies. And um, now these modernist societies have mostly collapsed after World War II, and we are uh, living in the aftermath of these societies that have been created um, basically in labs, where people designed the social systems that we are in that are optimized for growth, for feeding a large number of people, for having mass media to coordinate them, and so on. And these societies didn't invent good mechanisms for error correction, so they are manifestly unstable, which freaks people out right now. Okay, so the instability of the massive systems that ha are letting 8 billion of us play on this planet is one of the reasons why you predict that the S-curve goes down. Uh, you could put it another way. Every organism that stays around for a long uh, time is playing a very long game. So the, basically the fitness function of the evolution needs to uh, get to the individuals, not just in every generation, but over many generations. For instance, if you are a mouse and you live in a complicated ecosystem, you depend on many, many food species. If you have food scarcity, what happens is the next generation of mice is more sparse and more scrawny. And this happens for a few generations, so they don't overgraze on their environment. Mm -hmm. So the species can stick around in the long term if the, uh, their environment comes back and regrows, right? Mm -hmm. And we are now in the situation that we have the choice of feeding our children of having them being alive or having civilization being alive. And we always pick our kids, obviously, right? If you have the choice of having your children die or having civilization die in the long run, you want your ch children to have a good life. You want to make them well fed. You want to be, them to be healthy, to be educated. They should have a good house. They should have access to friends and computer games and so on. And because we are always confronted with this choice and individually we are basically unable to um, constrain ourselves in such a way that we all don't overgraze our resources. Yes. Um, we don't seem to have a force that would constrain us. But at the same time, we are heading in to a large degree towards the abundance of being able to grow our own things like meat and leather and all these other interesting ways of being able to sustain more effectively mm -hmm. on the planet, sequester carbon, um, uh, f fusion for energy. Mm -hmm. So it's just, how, how is it that we have either kids or long-term civilization? Why, why can't it be both providing for children and having long-term civilization? I think it uh, might be possible, but it's not going to be all roses if we would be doing this. We probably would have to submit to an organizing principle that is uh, extracting a heavy toll from us. I mean, it's conceivable that we create some AI dictatorship that organizes us yeah. in such a way that we live in a few population controlled habitats where we can outlive our days as a species in relative peace and harmony, basically some kind of people zoo. But if we let people self-organize, we are very much like orcs that overrun the environment and eat everything in the past. And then when we think about wow. how to make this sustainable, we tend to focus on this, these few ideas. Carbon sequestration is an excellent example. Uh, the reason why all this carbon is in the atmosphere, all this carbon dioxide, is because by burning the carbon and into carbon dioxide, we got the fuel that built the uh, industrial yeah. civilization in the first place. Yeah. The reason why we have 7.5 billion people living in relative comfort is because we burned all yes. this carbon and put right. it there. Yes. So basically, we are running on a debt. And paying yes. back this debt was never in the cards. And a carbon sequestration would mean basically we would need to use a multiple of that energy uh, to, without a business case, to get all this carbon out of the atmosphere again and bury it in the ground in a vein which it doesn't escape. Or and we are still burning carbon that we get out of the ground, right? We are still doing this. So the easiest way of carbon sequestration would be to stop burning any carbon at all, and uh, especially not getting new ones out of the ground, and we don't yeah. do this. So I think yes, it's yes. a pipe dream. It's wishful thinking. Okay, okay. People are very good at wishful thinking. It's an interesting phenomenon to observe. 
and it's also nothing to be upset about, right? It's just how people are. Like you said, the organizing principles are the things that can keep propagating the S-curve up if we can galvanize together and make these code changes within our social dynamics. Okay. If you have something that uh, has unlimited growth, it hits a singularity at some point, right? It's, there is no system that remains stable without symmetries. Okay. All right. This is an excellent intro to the episode. All right. Let's do the journey. So, okay. Born in Germany, loved computer science and AI growing up in philosophy as well. And then you ended up doing your PhD in cognitive science. You spent some time in New Zealand as well. So teach us about how, who you were growing up and how you even got interested in these fields. Well, I grew up in some somewhat insane society, communist Eastern Germany. It had burned the down its civilizational hive mind, so to speak. Every philosophy was replaced by a very vulgar version of um, materialist Marxist dialectic. And um, everything that your teachers told you seemed to be, at least to me, to my little nerd mind, insane and unbelievable. Like, not even the mathematics was correct, I felt as a child. and. I grew up as a child of an artist in the forest, so um, basically feral in a big cave full of books. And then I ventured out into the world after having uh, already read too many books. I met, uh, went to school, I was um, bored for eight years, then I went to a mathematics school, uh, then I saw that how what real mathematics looks like, and then I decided that it's possible to make sense of the world, but I would have to do it by myself. <laughs> but to understand the meaning of a statement, what it actually means, that something is true or not true, in some sense you have to go full circle, right? You have to go down to the foundations. And to make this journey to the foundations, that's in some sense my journey. Um, it's very hard to make this right as an autonomous intellect. Most of the autonomous intellects don't get very far, and I probably don't get very far either. Whenever I have a tremendous insight, I'm typically like 400 years late to the party. But uh, I discovered that these parties uh, become more interesting and obscure. Uh, th there are smaller parties now that I discover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, there are the big parties, right? There are uh, large groups of people that share ideas. And these um, large groups of people that share ideas, they are often not right. Because the principles by which people get to consensus are often not truth oriented, right? So uh, individual minds often get it right. And groups, uh, if they agree on the thing, that's not likely to be true. Like the scientific consensus on arbitrary topics is largely something that is going to change. Like mm -hmm. there was a, for a long time a consensus about nutrition. And mm -hmm. we now know it's, it's basically all wrong. And how is that possible? And it's, I think if we are, for instance, programmers, we realize it's impossible for us to even agree about simple things like which programming use for which kind of project. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do this. And if you have a consensus about complicated questions, more complicated than this, you need a force that builds consensus. And this force is probably not truth oriented, but consensus oriented. It's a political force. Right? So people, if they are thinking groups, tend to believe things for political reasons, not because they are true. So we have to find this balance. We have to figure out to which degree do we have people proper epistemology. And this question of epistemology is in some sense the foundation of our thinking. We should have all the possible beliefs, but shift evidence, um, uh, shift the confidence of according to the evidence Correct. on them, right? So yes. we can only believe something to the degree that we have evidence for it, mm -hmm. that it's possible that this is supported by something. Yeah. A belief should not be a verb. It's not related to us. We should not be identified with our beliefs. We should only be directed by truths. We don't get better people if we believe the right thing or worse people if you believe the wrong things. These are just things that we are looking at, models in our mind. Let's jump into this. That's, okay, yeah, let's do it. This, it totally actually uh, gave me a bunch of light bulbs when you were talking about who you are, how you became who you are. Yeah, <laughs> when you were talking, I was like, wow, this makes more sense along the way. You actually ended up moving to Cambridge as well, doing some time at MIT Media Lab and Harvard Evolutionary Dynamics before coming out here. Yeah. Well, just quick, what was the spark that got you to move from Germany to Cambridge to the United States? Um, well, I studied uh, computer science and philosophy. I found that um, philosophy was not as useful as I hoped. And uh, only later I learned that this was because of the state the philosophy in academia is in right now. It's mostly a simulation of the real thing. It's very hard to get paid for real philosophy. You typically get paid if you're a philosopher for um, being part of a particular culture 
of talking like a philosopher, reading like a philosopher, citing like a philosopher, and publishing like a philosopher. And it's very hard to do actual philosophy on the side, like intellectual progress. You're not incentivized to do that. And so more interesting progress, I think, happens in more foundational fields like computer science, where people have a formal education. And I studied a little bit of um, psychology and physics and so on. And then I did my PhD in cognitive science. And I found it hard to fit into the academic system as it was, because it was largely mostly interested in applying methods and not so much in answering the questions that I had. And so I started a few companies and um, co-founded them. And then I got an opportunity to um, work at MIT, mm -hmm. which I jumped on. And so I spent some time in the US. And uh, now I got an offer to join an amazing team in San Francisco called AI Foundation, mm -hmm. where uh, can work on some of my ideas on how to model motivation and emotion in more detail. Yeah, and the motivation and emotion of how we perceive the world as well as how machines will perceive the world is a central key to what we're gonna be discussing mm -hmm. now. So, all right, let's jump into it. We have some awesome visuals to show <laughs> you guys along the way. Okay, so we find ourselves in the 3D world, in the physical world. What is the relationship between the physical world and our minds? It's an age-old question, right? So we could first of all start out with this idea of what is access to the world. When I was in, sitting in front of my first computer, a Commodore 64 uh, at about 1983, uh, I looked at the screen and I realized that everything that I can think of can be displayed on a screen if I really know how to think about it, right? I can write a program that produces an arbitrary pattern on the screen. Everything that I perceive is some kind of pattern. So in some sense, my access to the world, to the universe out there, is to some kind of screen. And that screen might be my retina or my thalamus, and my brain is making sense of this. And to understand the world, I need to understand what a pattern generator looks like that is responsible for producing those patterns. So we can ask ourselves, what kind of computer do we need to produce the patterns that we observe, right? And it could be a discrete state machine like my Commodore 64 with a finite amount of memory, uh, or it could be a probabilistic state machine that randomly goes from state to state or has a certain degree of randomness in there. Or it could be some quantum computer where every state is a superposition of um, a gr a ground states, right? Or it uh, could be one of these versions, but with infinite memory. And number four is basically our discrete state machine with infinite memory is our old friend, the Turing machine, this mathematical formalization of modern computer. Or we could take the perspective of physics, which mostly thinks that the universe is geometric, which means uh, things move continuously. And is in, uh, there is at some, at least at the time level, infinite resolution. And uh, it could also be that it's even an acausal hypercomputer. So there could be closed time-like loops, so information could be sent back in time. All these are, in some sense, mathematical possibilities. But um, what we have discovered is that there is a difference between mathematics and computation. Mathematics is the domain of all languages in which you can specify things. And computation is the part that can be implemented. And there's something that um, was discovered um, earlier in the 20th century. Basically, Hilbert saw some inconsistencies, especially after looking at Cantor's set theory, when it came to infinities, to infinite sets, and the total set. And uh, he discovered we have a problem in the semantics of mathematics, in the way we define truth, and we define what is true at all. Please, mathematicians, fix our metamathematics. And so they went to work, and Gödel came back and said, I have bad news. We cannot really build a computer in mathematics that doesn't break while running the semantics of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a, oh, there's a question? Oh, that, that should be in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, what are his thoughts on psychedelics? <laughs> We're already getting asked about your thoughts on psychedelics from the audience. <laughs> May, 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 maybe we should uh, just take a quick, what are thoughts? No, that, that was by accident. Oh yeah. I think that psychedelics relax your priors, which means uh, there are more things that you consider to be true when you are in psychedelics, apparently, and as a result, uh, you can make inferences that you otherwise could not make, but which are largely wrong. So uh, it basically, psychedelics might help people to escape, escape local minima in the belief space, and it's the same uh, 
uh, purpose, I think, what dreams have, and I suspect that psychedelics are very similar to lucid dreaming mm -hmm. in their functionality. Escaping local minimum beliefs, yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah, but sometimes yes, the it, past it, that can be wrong. The like thing that you enter in does not have to be a better belief. It can be one that is fundamentally more loopy, especially yeah. if you fall in love with it and uh, don't escape that minimum again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we can become attached to that idea and then yeah. that, yeah, correct, versus continuing to have an open mind. Okay, yeah. yes. Keep going. So, uh, Turing also worked on this problem, the same one that um, Gödel worked on, and he um, discovered that um, th the same problem, right? Truth is defined via proofs in mathematics. Something is true if you can prove it. And a proof is the reduction of a statement to axioms. It's basically a form of data compression. You compress the statement to the axioms. And um, the way you do this is you apply a procedure. And mathematics is defined in a timeless fashion. So you can use infinite man in many steps to get there. And what Gödel and Turing discovered is that uh, you cannot use infinitely many steps because nobody can do this, right? Nothing can do this. You cannot make the claim that something is true when you cannot actually get there. In order to actually get there, you can only have finitely many steps, which means you have to redefine truth into something where you actually show the money, where you actually show how to get from your axioms to, to the proof in a finite number of mm -hmm, steps. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, in this sense, pi, for instance, is not a value pi is a function. You can run this function, it gives you new, di mm -hmm. new digits until mm -hmm. your local sun burns out, and this is it. Mm -hmm. But you can mm -hmm. never have a computation that depends on knowing the last digit of pi. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that a lot of physics uh, behaves as if you could. Because physics basically checked out this code library from mathematics without reading the comments. Especially the more recent ones that were done in the first half of the 20th century. So uh, basically the part of mathematics that works is constructive mathematics. It's the thing that you can implement, it's computation. Which means, um, of course we can build a, a causal hypercomputer in some sense, a computer that can send information back in time. We just do this by freezing this universe state, uh, then running a copy of the universe into the future, taking that information and merging it into the present state and continuing, right? So in some sense you can do this. Mm. You can not have a continuous universe, but you can have one that is arbitrarily quasi-continuous, that gets as close to continuity as you want. And on the level which, where we interact, there are always too many things to count, so if you squint, it's almost like infinite. So we look at these computations of how many parts behave in the limit, which means they're almost continuous. But if you zoom in, you realize it's still integers. It's still discrete. There is still only finite amounts of com uh, information being moved around in finite amounts of time. So in some sense, we can use computation as a metaphor, this uh, ability of a system to go from state to state with the transition function. It's a deterministic one if it's the same one every time, and a deterministic one if it's a different one every time. We can use this to understand the, all the pattern generators that compute, can produce observables. But we can also build minds that observe these principles and do anything that's computable, that, that is, make any kind of model. So basically, your Commodore 64 is enough if you give it enough memory. There's a very interesting question about quantum computers, of course. Because quantum computers um, have been around the corner for at least half a century. And we haven't gotten quite there yet. And it's an interesting question why that is. Why is it that we haven't gotten quite there yet? Is it because the formalization of quantum mechanics uh, is not completely computable and is only approximately true? Or uh, is it uh, because of something else? Because there's too much noise in there, maybe there is no continuous space underlying the whole thing, and uh, the non-local links create too much noise. Or uh, another way of looking at the whole thing is that the premise of quantum mechanics is that our particle universe is inefficiently implemented on the underlying substrate. If the particle universe is inefficiently implemented, we can harvest the computation of the underlying substrate. Like imagine you live in Minecraft, and you are efficiently implementing the CPU, then your CPU is only polynomial times faster than you are, right? So you cannot build a computer in Minecraft that is going to be faster than the normal computations in Minecraft, the classical mm -hmm. Minecraft mm -hmm. operations. Even if you use the CPU, you're only going to be faster by some polynomial amount of time. But if Minecraft is inefficiently implemented, if it's super slowly implemented on the CPU, within Minecraft you wouldn't notice. But if you could somehow harvest the computation under, that is underneath it, even if it's a classical one, it would be uh, more than polynomial fast with respect to, to the computers that we can make from Minecraft particles, right? So th this is the interesting question. Basically, is our universe efficiently implemented or inefficiently implemented? But it's still going to be computational. 
Okay, so let's go back a step and let's think about what's our relationship to the universe. What's the relationship between mind and universe, right? Okay. And so the traditional that position... That was an in interesting priming <laughs> for, the <laughs> for, for the first question. Oh, man. Holy cow. There's, it's, it's very evident that you've taken a lot of time to synthesize these fields together into... Uh, what you're presenting to us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right, let's uh, let's, so, let's uh, basically the idealist position that you find in many Eastern religions, for instance, and is the one that we live in a dream, right? The reality that we perceive is not mechanical. There is something else going on. It's a dream in which magic is possible, in which you can have precognition, in which you can perform rituals that change the course of the planets and human destiny and so on, in which astro astrology works. All these things are only explainable not by us not living in a mechanical universe, but in a dream universe that is dreamt by a higher mind, by a mind on a higher plane of existence, right? So you can have these symbolic interactions. You make this ritual sacrifice, and as a result, your life changes. How is that possible? Th this is uh, something that we can basically only explain by accepting that we live in a dream if we think that is real. You could also say um, we have a dualist situation where your mind and the universe are basically separate computers that interact through an interface. Um, so we have our computational mind that is making sense of the world, and on the other side we have our computational universe. And um, the typical position that we have right now in our Western world is um, a monist position, where basically your universe gives you the computations on which you have um, your mind run. Basically the part of the universe that runs your mind is the brain, and on that uh, brain computer, we generate in interpretations of what's happening in the outside world. And we observe the world through some kinds of observational interface, like our retinas and cochleas and so on, mm -hmm. and the surface of our body. Okay. And why is this mono? Um, monism, because it's it only monism? one thing. There is not uh, a mind world and a material world, but it's all the material world, right? It's all this primary substrate in which we exist in, the, in a monist world. So basically the materialist monism says the universe is mechanical and everything that happens in your mind is part of that mechanism. Okay. okay. And what I would suggest is a small correction or a small uh, change to this perspective. I think that these positions are uh, of materialism, monist materialism and monist idealism, where you only have dreams and where you only have um, the material world, actually it's in some sense complementary. Mm -hmm. I think that you do exist in a dream. But it's a dream that is being dreamt in the brain of a primate. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, right? And this mm -hmm. primate lives in the physical universe. Yes. So the mind of the, on the higher plane of existence is in physics. Physics is the higher plane of existence. The reason why uh, previous civilizations were largely not interested in describing this higher plane of existence is because they didn't have devices to play with physics or uh, because they didn't have social technology by which a philosopher could change uh, the feudalist agricultural society that they were living in. And they were not putting much emphasis on this, right? If you don't get along with the world as it is, you need to change the way you perceive it. You need to change your motivations. You need to change the way you generate your dream of the world and your place in it. And if you adjust this, you're usually fine. Or you're not, but you're as fine as you can be under the circumstances. Right, so basically you focus on this inner world and how you generate your perception of reality in these techniques and, and, and this is something that we largely don't do in the West. Our Western rationality was largely leave the mind alone and instead mm. if, if you don't like something, change reality. So we focus on this outside world and we neglect the way our perception is generated. Mm, mm. And um, a lot of people, even a lot of Western philosophers uh, are fascinatingly unaware of the fact that we live in a dream that the same circuits that make dreams at night, they make a dream during the day. Only the dream during the day is tuned to predict your sensory patterns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so it's, it's a model that mm -hmm. we make. What is a model? It so starts so out when, we're, when we're in our dream space and when we're in our awake space, we are running, s we're using same neural architecture within, yes. uh, within ourselves for both of those situations. Um, yet there is a, in the in the physical world, there is a a there is a um, uh, this this machine made from neurons, <laughs> and and there is there is a a uh, you called it a a dream a dream a dream state that we're in in the body of a primate. Yes. 
But the monism is that it's all in the f in this. It's all. There is basically a, only a mechanical universe, and the mechanical universe creates emergent patterns. But uh, we are as real as a character in a novel. You and me are characters in a multimedia novel that is being authored by the brain. Star of my own movie. <laughs> yeah. I keep telling you, Alex. The star of our own movies, all of us. Yeah. But a star of our own movies or star of collective? A collective movie. There is no way you can get out of your individual dream. The collective is part of your dream. It's not that other minds tell you what to do. You interpret a part of the universe of the patterns that you see on your retina as being emanations of other people. Other minds are your invention. Other minds are my invention. Yes. You, you, you can only perceive other invention. minds to the degree that you can perceive my mind. That you construct a model of it. That you think I'm a, a sentient being that mm -hmm. uh, you can interact with. Yes. But this interaction takes place entirely in your own mind. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's <laughs> uh, uh, there's so so much to yeah. There is no way to wake up from yeah. this dream. And ever you find yourself immersed in a reality, you are in a trance state where you basically take some representation and think you are inside of that. It's a similar trance to when you see a movie, right? When you see a movie, you suspend your disbelief and you are that cowboy that uh, sees the wild west and you ride along the prairie and then suddenly the light goes on and realize, oh my God, this is all not true. I'm in a different reality now, right? And you cannot wake up from that one. At least you cannot wake up from it without losing what makes you human, what makes, lets you make sense of the world. And there's, and there's a, a, the, my, my ability to change the way that I perceive versus changing a physical world that was one of the points that you yeah. made. So we can kind of upgrade our own perception of reality and the way that we engage with the reality that we're yeah. embedded in versus trying to necessarily change that physical yes. reality. It's often also very necessary that we become aware of that. Right? For instance, if you have self-hatred, you perceive that the universe is mean to you, that uh, you're uh, experiencing many ways, uh, ways that the universe treats you badly. And you also treat yourself badly because part of your software does not really buy into you. It thinks this thing that you are is very flawed and should not really be supported. Right? So if you don't like yourself, uh, you are going to punish yourself in some sense, which means your mind is going to create a simulation in which reality treats yourself badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this will sometimes lead to bad outcomes. Sometimes it might lead to better ones. There is a reason why your mind thinks this is the best setup. But uh, this perception that you have of reality is virtual. This identification that you have with your beliefs and your experiences is something that's generated inside of your mind. It's basically like a groove that is pulled through a, a record in a record player. Mm -hmm. And uh, the record is the groove of your life. And you're being pulled through this. And when you dream, you can put this groove into something else. Or when you are in the psychedelic state, like uh, our friend here asked. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, so this identification with what you feel, what you experience, in some sense, it's your. It can become your choice. You can yes. become responsible for this. So I can I can simulate a self hatred state, or I can simulate a self love state. Yes. And so upgrading my perception is upgrading the way that I choose yes. which I si which I simulate, which yes. which I collapse into my reality. You could also uh, get to a neutral state in which you realize that uh, all these evaluations that you put on there where you think that you are super lovable or uh, super flawed are uh, actually not helpful or not truthful. And you just are, you're just a physical system. And you're not in the category of things that has the ability to be adequate or inadequate. You just exist and you deal with that. Okay, yes, yes, <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> Good, so how do we make models? A um, okay. um, model is basically a, a set of variables, things that can change, and the relationships between them, the, the relationships are the things that don't change, the invariances, right? The, uh, the relation between the different variables is, um, for instance, the laws of perspective. They don't change in the world in which we exist. That's an invariance. And the laws of perspective uh, dictate if I see your nose and your nose points in a particular direction, which is a free variable, it predicts the position of your face. Your face should point in the direct, same direction as your nose. 
Mm. Otherwise, I'm looking at something that is impossible. So these relationships are, in some sense, they are possibilistic. And the world that we are in is not a probable world, it's a possible world. Even if a tiger comes after you and it is not uh, probable, it should still be possible to represent this, right? And we will always try to find an interpretation of our sensory patterns that is possible, where every feature that we perceive is compatible according to the relationship that we've learned to all the others. But in order to, to get there, uh, we need to learn probability because there are infinitely many possible states or almost mm -hmm. infinitely many. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we see a bunch of patterns after we wake up in the morning, we need to converge on one of these possible states. So we know that your nose being pointed a certain way is where your face is going to be pointed with almost 100% accuracy, yes. almost. If not, then we have learned that there are hooked noses. So we will yes. put our attention on this thing where we have these inconsistencies and we will try to resolve it. And this means usually we extend the model. And this is largely how we learn. We discover inconsistencies in our models and then we extend them okay. by adding new relationships or modifying existing ones. Yes. Right? Yes. And, uh, if we have a model that already works, most of the time, then we need a way to get it to converge to what we currently perceive. The patterns that we have in the environment need to be uh, interpreted with a particular kind of model. So we get this model state by following probability. And the probability tells you if I see the following patterns, it's likely that the following model should apply and I should interpret the world in this particular way. And these links uh, are responsible, for instance, for optical illusions. They're shortcuts that make us see the world in a particular way, even though it might be different but it helps you to speed up your convergence to a particular state. Mm. That's why we have many of these illusions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have the preferences. They give color to our perception, right? It's not just all meaningless, interesting, structured patterns. It's there is something going on that is relevant to us that mm -hmm. because it can give us pleasure and pain. And these preference relationships, uh, they uh, tell us how certain things deviate from a target instead of just measuring them absolutely, right? So mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. In some sense, this measurement uh, that is not absolute but relative is an identification where mm -hmm. you think something <coughs> should be like this instead of it just is like this. And this is where we could say within the model there are motivations. Yes. And the motivations guide us towards the preferences. Yes. And the preference means you are a system that wants to change these things towards that preference. So when you feel pain, you might have a preference to make that pain end. And in some sense, it's the nature of that pain, right? Or if you feel uh, that you live in a world that is not just. You might uh, feel a pain that directs you on making it more just. And you identify with this. You realize I am a system that is directed on making the world more just. And it is uh, some imposition on the world that you make. And it might be a good one. It might have good outcomes. It might also be that the just world never existed and wouldn't even work. But it's a commitment that your mind makes that you sh should perceive the world in a particular way. The world should be different than it is. And this sense that the world should be different than it is, that's the purpose for, of the existence of our mind is to help the organism to regulate for its evolutionary needs. And when we are, when we are born into the world, do we have within us already the DNA for the preferences and for the motivations, for what our character decides is the thing that's our North Star? To some degree, I think so. Uh, I found that in my own children, after they were born, they had very strong preferences. And uh, eventually what became more detailed was not the preferences, but their ideas, their own ideas of what exactly the preferences are and how to realize them. And that largely depends on the environment. But I suspect that the things that make you happy or unhappy are things that are determined innately in the organism. Yeah. And also makes sense, right? Because motivation is not adaptive, it's resistive. Motivation is how you resist physics and society and everything else. It's not to give in, and just resolve into a puddle on the ground. It's where you push against reality. It's where you regulate. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be innate. It cannot be adaptive. We're running within us the motivations that we want to adapt change our perception but also as well in the reality that we live in with what we want to do in that reality how we want to change that reality yeah. towards those motivations those preferences but of course we can learn to change this to some degree we can learn to disidentify with certain from certain things but yes. it's hard and it typically happens relatively late in our life yes yes okay so basically the control of this organism starts with feedback loops and they're implemented in, in our brainstem, our reptilian side, so to mm -hmm. speak. 
So there are lots of feedback loops that regulate your breathing patterns, heart rate, uh, your body movements, and so on. And as soon as it becomes so complicated that it cannot be done automatically, um, it, uh, you create models of this in your neocortex. And in between, you have these identifications where you... So, so this, is your this is autonomic nervous yeah. system, blinking, yes. heart rate, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. but you can make all these things, um, you can s submit them to your own control. And you usually do so when the aut uh, automatic regulation fails. Then okay. you will spawn some cortical process that takes care okay. of regulating your okay. uh, reality. So the most primordial feedback loops are at the most limbic, earliest yes. reptilian. So I structure. think they're being made available here at the brainstem uh, because they have the potential that they need to be regulated. For instance, if you, uh, your health becomes fragile, you might need to pay uh, attention to your heart rate and you can learn how to regulate your heart rate. Mm. But uh, as long as that's not necessary because your autonomous regulation of the heart rate is perfect, mm -hmm. uh, you're unaware of your heart rate. And I suspect this happens for almost all the things. You, whenever your feedback loops are sufficient, you don't need to pay attention and you don't need to run lots of quantum computations on it. Yes. And the attention is necessary to create new mental processes that then become automated. And as soon as they're automatic, you usually don't spend attention on them anymore. Yes. Which means you cannot remember them. They're not, you're not, no longer conscious of them, right? And then if we want to remember, we need to go through the process of yeah. going through that yeah, tedious remembering yeah. Yeah, of how to do that. Okay. So the limbic system is in some mm -hmm. sense implementing a, a machine of motivation where you have social and cognitive and physiological needs and they yeah. all compete. Yes. And uh, they create different pleasure and pain signals. And when we act, we don't just act on pleasure and pain, we act on models of them, which you could call purposes. And these, uh, the needs don't form a hierarchy. They just coexist and compete. They don't form a hierarchy? No, needs just coexist. They might be, have different strengths. But uh, there are people that uh, might starve because they serve political goals or uh, because their children are more important to them. Right? It's not that you first uh, solve existential safety and then you do the revolution or then you do the art. It might be that you do this all at the same time and you just get drawn to these things in different proportions. And depending on the opportunity and uh, the relative strengths of the need at a given moment, you are more drawn to this or more drawn to that. But when you want to coordinate your life, you need to make models of them. You need to understand um, concepts like survival. Survival itself, I don't think it's a need. It's too complicated, right? You need to understand death in order to understand survival. Death is a complicated concept. It was difficult to understand for my children. I remember when they realized, oh, some organisms stop moving at some point and all people at some point they're no longer around and this will also happen to me mm -hmm. and it's something that happens relatively late it's not in the first few months but uh, in the first few months you already have pain avoidance and some sense of existential safety and so on you only combine this into a purpose of survival when you are able to form the model and these purposes they need to form a hierarchy so they become accountable to each other Mm -hmm. And this hierarchy has different solutions in different people. So in yes. some sense, the shape of your soul is the hierarchy of your purposes. Mm -hmm. And the top node is usually not the ego. The ego is just the function that integrates the expected reward over the next 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. And the really interesting functions are above that, where you serve long-ranging purposes, and this allows us to cooperate because we serve shared purposes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that's at the core of this yes. altruistic love is the discovery of shared purpose and others. Yes, so the North Star that we find most meaning in doing every single day usually transcends our own ego towards the yes. sh shared purpose. That yes, we you also realize you, your ego is just a lot of work. Why do you keep it up? Right? There needs to be an underlying purpose to make that necessary. You need to be relatively stupid to think everything is only important for your ego because you're not thinking very far, mm -hmm. because you're not getting much out of the ego ultimately. It's not creating that much pleasure to have an ego. Gosh, this part is such a m mixed bag of motivations, even right there, cognitive, physiological, and social. Yeah, it's a huge mixed bag, and however we end up determining what the next yeah, step is, is a huge mystery at times. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it gets more boring when you figure it all out, right? <laughs> 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 and you always know what the next step is. Yeah, yeah, it definitely gets more boring. If, if you, well, if you, you know, uh, hopefully when we run the simulations, we can gain more insight um, through these processes. And yeah, 
Looks like we're yeah already potentially in an eighty year process of leveling up some character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine you had an Allen simulation that tells you always what your next step is, that outmodels you and thinks a few steps ahead and tells yeah. you these are your options and this is the one that you're going to pick and this is the one that you should be picking. Yeah. <laughs> We could potentially visualize that even right now. Right. Like what, yeah, what is the next best yeah, option? Yeah, correct. And to be able to be in a state of constantly engaging with that is yeah. uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. But it's also, it can be, uh, it takes all the mystery away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Neurons live in <laughs> lonely <laughs> universes. I thought about how is the neuron able to do this. When we do AI, we typically think about how to impose the will of the mind on matter. So when you think about how Minsky built AI, you had an idea of how things work, and then you implement this as an algorithm that plays chess or does whatever, right? And now we live in the second phase of AI where we have systems that discover the solution to a problem. So we give a problem and a loss function that tells the system how to, well it does on the problem to the algorithm, and the algorithm figures out how to implement this solution. But it's still a very top-down, centralized control. And our neurons are doing it very differently. Every, uh, there is no centralized control in the brain because everything has to be implemented with individual cells. The cell is the smallest unit there from some perspective. You also take different ones where it's even smaller and it's molecules within the cells, right? But if you take the cell as the smallest unit of compression, then you have your neuron. And the neuron, in some sense, it lives in the darkness. It's, uh, it's a small animal that tries to get fed and they link up. It's a, um, embryonal uh, neurons in the petri dish. Mm -hmm. And they try to find connections to each other and they try to learn which signals in the environment predict anticipated reward. So yeah, which, yeah. which signals they should fire on as, uh, to get fed in, in return. In and this, this is case, in some sense all they do. Dopamine is our reward. So uh, functionally, uh, dopamine is globally for the brain responsible for reward. It also has a few other local roles. I suspect what happens is that the brain ca is very good at making a few dozen chemicals. Some of these chemicals are, uh, can be very quickly exchanged, some of them more slowly, and it uses them as a language. And the words of these, this language, one of these words is dopamine, this molecule, they mean yeah. something different in different contexts. Okay. And when you, for instance, use a dopaminergic drug like uh, Adderall, it often interacts with other systems, you use the same language. So in a stridum, uh, dopamine means something different than in the prefrontal cortex. And as a result, you get, might get more control, but you also get more ticks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so it's because uh, it's not one thing, it's just a, a particular kind of language that is being spoken between the neurons. Yes, yes. But the, from the individual neurons, some of them are more serotonergic neurons and yeah, they yeah. get rewarded by acting on serotonin. Yes, yes, okay, okay. And then they're moving uh, towards what g brings the highest uh, reward towards the motivation, the preferences. Basically your neurons will learn whatever you feed them for. Whatever you feed them for. Yes, okay. so the basic, the, your organism is setting up the brain in such a way that the neurons get fed if they regulate what you want to regulate. If, if, the, if the, mm, mm, uh, the trajectory that I'm collapsing is in the area of, of self-doubt, uh, pity, um, sadness, disparity, etc., that there's gonna be a feedback system within my brain in that direction versus uh, collapsing towards self-love, care, harmony with others. So, so there's a, there is a neurological process that's occurring um, with the, the, the way that neurons are firing and wiring together. Yes, but this is already super high level and there are many predefined circuits with respect to controlling your social interactions and so on. And if you don't have certain priors built inside of your brain, you're probably not going to figure this out. Uh, high-functioning autistic people that are not very social mm -hmm. because they didn't start out with the same priors mm -hmm. and uh, their life was not long enough to converge to the same optimum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as uh, other people did. And then it's also this question, is it an optimum? Yeah, correct. Or is exactly. it really serving the individual or the species or whatever is directing that evolution optimally? Yes. And that's something that you can only see when you zoom very far out. Yeah. yeah. So, but on the lowest level, um, for instance, neurons try to predict the patterns in the environment and react on them. And so the way we perceive reality, I think, can be understood like a synthesizer. Okay. So, so for instance, when you get signals coming in from your cochlea, um, you don't take the frequencies of sound because neurons cannot oscillate at 20 kilohertz. 
um, neurons like to oscillate at something like 20 hertz. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. first decompose the sound into different energy spectra and you have little hairs in this snake-like organ um, or snail-like organ in your mm -hmm. uh, uh, inner ear and they react depending on the energy of the sound at different frequencies. And mm -hmm. they send this to the brain and the brain is now trying to make sense of these patterns. And it makes sense of these patterns by being able to predict them. So when the sound starts, it tries to continue the sound to know what's happening next. And when it does this, it's able to explain it. So you can do this very similar to a synthesizer. You have a few knobs and you have an oscillator and there's some almost random connection of cir uh, circuits and you tune them until you get the sound you want. And when you are used to your particular synthesizer, you get pretty good at this, right? And you don't only do this for sound, but you can also do this for um, vision. So uh, you look for spatial frequencies, for colors, and so on, and you build lots and lots of synthesizers in your brain that are able to predict and continue these patterns once they start occurring. And once they are uh, done with training and they don't get better, you uh, combine the synthesizers and try to find the meta patterns, the patterns in the patterns and across different modalities. And uh, so you find, for instance, percepts. You realize that different sounds are related by pitch. You can explain a family of sounds by just changing the pitch between them or the loudness. You get a new message? <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately, you get something where you unify all the simulations and your, uh, all the percepts in your mind, and what you get is a cohesive simulation where everything moves around in three-dimensional space. Because this is the simplest explanation that we can find for the things that are going on, on uh, in our cochlea and uh, field of vision. Okay, so we have uh, both auditory input and visual input here, and but tactile, we, input. tactile input as well. But so what you're what you're explaining is that we have a a way with our, our auditory senses to slowly build layers of strut that give us yeah. something. Then visually, same thing, build layers that give us something. Yes. And then we smash even these together to give us this yes. moving. Until you yeah. get a unified model of the world. And it's basically the biggest uh, unsolved task in AI, how to do this unified model of the world. Instead of um, having a bunch of classifiers that react to individual feature complexes in the world, learn everything into a single function, into one universe. And this is what we're able to do, right? You, you try to make sense of the universe in one function. There's one way in which the reality works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's such a beautiful thing here that is able to take in yeah. all of the different senses and yeah. create that model. But with AI, this is the grand challenge, one of the grand AI, challenges. AI is basically the way to, uh, for us to think about this and take this to the next level. In some sense, the because biggest a step in the maturation of a mind is understanding its own nature. It's understanding how we work. And AI is the best chance that we have in finding it out by making testable theories. And to be able to take in that much more information and compute on all that is creatively, run all the permutations, I mean, that's like a massive holy grail for, for advancing us and I'm, yeah, okay, this is great. This is who's great. Who's in charge of the AI anyway? Like who's who's in charge of AI? Yosha thoughts. Uh, our own AI or uh, which AI? Just the, the AI in AI we trust. The the AI that is going to become our our god, our government. You mean who, like in Game of Thrones, where you have yeah, some human being that takes Jesus. over? <laughs> I don't watch yeah. GRT, uh, I don't know. So who, 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 who's in charge of the AI that becomes the super intelligence? Who's in charge of the super intelligence? That's an uh, interesting open question. I mean, we, how can we know now? Right? Yeah. It's difficult to predict things, especially when they are in the future. And so why should it be a who, like a human being? At the moment, we typically put a single human being at the top of a company or of a state. Mm -hmm. And I think that is for a particular reason. Okay. And it's not obvious, right? Why don't you have a team to run for president? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as if an individual would be able to achieve anything and without yeah. having the right team, right? Yeah. If you have the wrong team, you're not going to achieve anything under any circumstances if it's complicated. And so the team really makes you or fails you. But why is that this individual? And I think it's because if you have a system that has very complex rules, we cannot really express this well as an algorithm. It's too brittle. 
it's too easy to get this wrong. And if you have a committee, if you have a group that makes the decisions, you basically need to come down to rules of compromise and so on. And the rules are not always the best solution. Right? If you think every decision should be done by voting uh, between a group of individuals that you select with a certain function, you will discover there are circumstances where this was not the best solution. The, and uh, yeah. this does not mean that there is an alternative which is always the best solution. So the yeah, rules yeah. of what you need to do if you want to put the system in a particular direction, eventually they need to be implemented in a single mind. Because a single mind is right now the most complicated information processing system mm. that is completely integrated with itself. It makes sense of the world in a particular way that we have. So in some sense, for instance, the German elections are about not just having party politics, batting it out against each other, but by finding the best German, the most German German of, of their generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results are uh, mixed a little bit, but most Germans think that it's largely successful. So in some sense, Angela Merkel is the most German German of her generation mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from some particular perspective. And she embodies where this country should go. And she's the one that ultimately makes a lot of the decisions, not all the details, mm -hmm. not of mm -hmm. checks and balances and oversight and many boards and so on, but this main direction that you cannot express all in rules and codes of conduct and so on, they need to be implemented in a single individual in, in a sense. And when we give everything to an AI, the question is, do we do this right? Is this thing, uh, or do we need to have a human in the loop? And if we do this, are we going to increase the fallacy of this human being, like mm -hmm. we did in German fascism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We have a tightly controlled system that removes a lot of the redundancy, makes the system extremely powerful and effective. But if this guy at the top if, is insane, yeah. horrible things happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the same danger with AI, of course. How can you make sure that you're not accidentally implementing something that you would think is insane? And what is sane, right? Yes. Is it not insane to wake up in a monkey? Mm -hmm. And it's not a nice monkey, it's a pretty vile monkey from the perspective of basically every other species, expect maybe the parasitic species that parasitize on humans like dogs and cats and so on, we are pretty vile. But the trees probably don't like us very much. <sighs> yeah, there, again, there's just so many good things there. I really appreciated how you said that there's a time when there's a, uh, an optimal function for uh, the dynamically adjusting system that can see when it's best for um, a team to step up and handle something versus an individual to step up and handle something or the collective to handle something. There's the adjusting of a super intelligence to be able to um, handle things like that and just like the governance structures of today's civilization. But yeah, is it insane to wake up in a monkey suit? Yes, it is very insane to wake up in a monkey suit. Why aren't we waking up in other things yet? Well, maybe we will create the substrates that enable us to walk, uh, wake up in different <laughs> suits. A dolphin. <laughs> Ron wants to wake up in a dolphin uh, for a couple hours, couple days. Yeah, no, me too. a lifetime. A lifetime? Yeah. Yeah, I want to bounce between like eagle, octopus. I want to go outside of this universe to other designer universes that are not like this one, that are not governed in this way. There's this weird uh, story about Mullah Nasruddin, um, Mohaja Nasruddin, some Sufi mystic that uh, may have existed at some point. And uh, he is going to a bank and he's being asked to identify himself. And he pulls out his mirror and he looks in the mirror and says, it seems to be me. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Do you, yeah. What do you recognize when you see in the mirror? <laughs> Yeah. What is that thing? What, what is, is it that, that you are? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Great question. Great question. So maybe there is nothing there. And it's, maybe there is nobody in charge. Maybe it's an emergent thing that invents every moment a new person to be in charge. Mm. And that person thinks it's you because it believes it shares memories with you. To upload you is very simple. Just make a machine that thinks it's you. Mm. Some of your friends might disagree, but just upload them too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ron definitely feels that way, yeah. So uh, we were at the neurons. The neurons form columns. The columns are a function approximators that talk to each other. Basically, the neurons form small teams that, uh, because they discover that they're better at anticipating reward yeah. and how to get fed if they form these teams and organizational units. Yes. And this is a process that we are not able to replicate yet. So the algorithms that our machines are implementing right now are much more, um, you could say, primitive, but maybe not primitive, thought top-down or bottom-up. 
And it's very hard to think bottom up with many moving parts. It's much easier for us to think top down in terms of control, mm -hmm. not of emergent control. We kind of do the same thing in society as human that is a neuron that yeah. works together in the hive mind that is civilization. Yeah, because so we are more optimally yeah. get the electricity and education and all that stuff together. Yeah. yeah. Then, like you said, in an 80 year lifetime, you'd never be able to learn how to create a language. Uh, yeah. So we got lucky and we got the language, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our brain is made from these building blocks, from cortical columns, and these columns organize into maps, into these brain areas. We have about 50 of those, and they're linked together and talk to each other, and they basically um, s they take these patterns. The patterns are visual, auditory, tactile, proprioceptive, mm -hmm. emotional, and our imaginations, and so on. Organize this into percepts. And these percepts. And pro proprioceptive again is. Is your body. So, what does it feel like where your limbs are, for instance? Okay. And, um, How is that not tactile? Uh, tactile is your body surface. Outside? Tactile is outside, proprioceptive is inside. It's, uh, like, for instance, if you feel that your limbs are moving in a particular way, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a tactile uh, feeling, okay. but it's a sense where you are in space. Okay, okay. Right? Okay, so spatial and also yes. spatial. Okay, okay. The spatial thing is constructed, but you feel, for instance, acceleration and so on. Okay, yeah, got it, got it. And you combine this into simulations. So you take the uh, visual, auditory, and part of the tactile stuff, combine yes. this into your model of the environment, you take the tactile and proprioceptive stuff, and this is somatosensory, mm -hmm. you take the proprioceptive emotional, uh, and emotional stuff, this is your motivational experiences that you have, like hunger and thirst and so on, and pain. And then we have uh, emotion, imaginations that gives rise to a mental world. And a part of that inner of this mental motivational somatosensory world gets combined into a model of the self and another part gets combined into a model of the world around you right so, so you we're going patterns to per to perceptions to then all these combine into us into our world view yes yeah. but they're not being perceived by anything because they're not related to something they will be related to the self and the self starts out with being somatic social and personal Right? So you relate to others, and this is an important part to yourself. You relate to your own body, that's an important part to yourself. And you relate to yourself as a person. You have a biography and expectations and desires. And all this is what you think you are, right? And then you have your mental stage in your simulations. There's this world states that you cannot actually, that are not factual, that are memories, that are imaginations, that are constructions that you do in your mind, things that you imagine. And we also need to generalize over the world states into global maps. And we unify our knowledge about ourselves and the world into, um, into knowledge. And then we have an attentional system, a conductor yeah, of our yeah, cortical yeah, orchestra. Yeah. And this gives you an attentional self that tells you, this mm -hmm. is what I'm currently yes, focused yes, on, yes, right? Yes, yes. And uh, this attentional self uh, is very important for selecting percepts from yeah, the environment yeah, yeah. and directing your attention on the things loop. at hand. Yeah, yeah. And right, it helps you right. also to control your simulations. So uh, this control is done by the self. The Gosh, self gives the you the information the on how you control it. The attentional system is so uh, critical in the process, especially as we're in the attention economy where we're being dragged around by the devices and the business plans and the beeps and the boops and other people trying to get our attention. So to be able to parse uh, adequately towards the North Star and be able to have a strong yeah. feedback loop is such a critical part of this. I like how you broke it down so carefully. And I know we're still going, but it, I love the nuance of the breakdown. Thanks. It's so good. So uh, the control of the attention is really from the self. It's I who pays attention because I need this, because I want this, because I don't want that, right? This is what directs it. And in order to uh, remember what you did in the past, you maintain a protocol. And this protocol of what you paid attention to, that's basically your stream of consciousness. Yeah. And this enables your biographical self. Uh -huh. This lets yeah. you remember, I was the person that did that. And uh, I did this a moment ago, I did this that last year, and so on. This uh, works by a biographical memory. Yes. And um, so this is basically the rough architecture of something that's a self and a person emerge in a mind that makes models. The yes. brain itself is not conscious. Neurons are not conscious, they're just physical systems. Physical systems cannot be conscious. But it would be very useful for a mind to know what it would be like to be conscious. So it creates the simulation of a conscious being in a dream world. Mm -hmm. 
And um, we are that simulacrum of a conscious being. Yes. Only a simulation can be conscious. Some people think a simulation cannot be conscious, but they got it backwards. Only a simulation can. Only a simulation yes. can be conscious. Because consciousness is a simulated property. It's not a physical property. Consciousness so, is a simulated yeah. property of you the nervous yourself, system of the primate. Am I conscious? Do yeah. I really experience this? And your mind says, yes, you are. You totally experience this. Okay, hold on. So, <laughs> so then a dog is also running their own simulation. Yeah. Okay, and then a... Uh, but then the the question of this whole unity, the whole all that is, all is consciousness also. Well, uh, there is this illusion that people have that they think that the dream is the physical reality. There is a physical ground truth and this physical ground truth is not conscious as far as we know. It does not talk to us. It doesn't seem to want anything from us. The physical universe, as far as we can see, is just a computer. It doesn't care. Okay. And uh, the reason why you perceive the world as meaningful is because it's generated in your mind to model your meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, the core of this meaning is typically you. The thing that is buried below the obelisk, the hidden referent of all these mystical symbols is always you. You so were always the chosen one. So, so the, tr the tree <laughs> has consciousness? I'm not sure about this. We're not sure about this. I, I don't. I'm not. So, um, some people might be. Uh, okay. I don't have okay. uh, a clincher for this. I don't we, have okay. evidence that tells me whether a tree is conscious or not. Okay, okay. So I'm re agnostic. Okay, interesting. Because but but like with the dog and the other, even yeah. insect, a fly. I'm not sure if flies are conscious. But dog, yes. And I think dogs are sufficiently okay. similar to us and they yes. have many okay. properties where you would think yeah, they do run a, si a simulation in which they have a self and they attribute properties to the self in relationship yes. to the environment and they okay. have some inner protocol. So basically they have all the elements of that it thing. It feels like a fly also does somewhat similar, um, less of this likely, yes, and then same with the tree, in just in terms of making dis the decision-making systems and the communication systems and the roots and, and, the, and the atmosphere as For well. For instance, flies, when they perceive the world, they seem to be mostly modeling uh, flow fields. So um, when we see the world, the first step, imagine you are some kind of frog. So you live under a dome and a hemisphere. And in this hemisphere, there are sometimes black dots moving, which are edible. Yes. And you uh, just need to target them in this 2D world. If they are close enough, you get them. Yes. So you basically need to realize when they move in a particular pattern and they are large enough. Yes. And uh, you, you can get them. Yes. And you also realize how this dome is changing when you move, right? Yes. So there's a flow field in which things move around. It's not clear that frogs are able to generalize over the domes into a 3D world and realize okay. that they don't live in a sequence of domes that they can go between by moving in certain patterns, but that there's a cohesive world that gives rise to all these domes, like we do and dogs do. And flies probably don't have an idea of a 3D world. Okay. Okay, okay. All right. And then, but then the physical world, though, the all that is is consciousness, the panpsychist view, you're, you're like, no, is. No, no, it's an internal observation that you're making. Phenomenologically, it's true because uh, where you realize that everything that you can perceive is generated by your mind and is editable by your mind. Okay. So, in okay. some sense, this is accurate phenomenologically. You can see from the inside that everything that you perceive is a representation generated by your mind and it's all changeable. There is no limit to this. You can tell a five-year-old, uh, model the fact that there is an omnipotent being, which means has full mm -hmm. right access on your memory and perception, and voila, they have a God in their world that is changing the world and makes miracles happen. Okay. All right, all right. Yes, let's continue. So another thing that the attention learning uh, is, uh, system is doing is learning. Our neural networks learn layer by layer, usually. Mm -hmm. and it's relatively slow and inefficient because we need to change so many links. So imagine you want to teach a neural uh, system to play tennis and you do this end-to-end -end learning. Every time you d do the uh, beating in the wrong way, you will uh, have to change all the links. Even the perceptual system has to be adapted and so on. It's only that you, uh, by accumulating lots and lots of training data, all these changes cancel each other out, except for the change that you need to make to get better at playing tennis. And you can improve on this very slow algorithm by pinpointing the position, like m improving my upper, upper hand or something like this, mm -hmm. this attention. And this is what your conductor is doing. So when you want to get better at tennis, you say, okay, when this ball comes like this, I will move my hand slightly different than I normally do, and I will make this. And I hope that this following thing will emerge. And this is what you store on your protocol memory. Yes. And a few moments later, when you see how this worked out, you'll recall the original situation, and you can reinforce or undo the change. 
And this is a very efficient learning algorithm that our brain is using and our machines are yes. only beginning to approximate. And then we can shortcut the learning algorithms by having uh, mentors or going out into the social world and learning from others mm -hmm. how to better play tennis so that we don't have to experience the rookie mistakes. Yes. But it also means that not only we have to have a model of uh, our own architecture. So we, in order to make that happen, to have this attentional learning, you need to know the fact that in order to win at tennis, you need to move your hand in a particular way. And this hand control is done in a particular part of your cognitive architecture and how you can control this particular thing, right? And if you want to be a good trainer at this, you also need to learn this architecture of the other person and their control architecture, how to direct their attention on that particular thing. And the better you are, the more effective you are as a teacher. There are teachers that can play, uh, teach you to play decent tennis in uh, the less than an hour, mm -hmm. and there are others that take weeks yeah. because they're not able to direct your attention. That's right, yeah. Well said, yes, yes. So another part is what happens if, like in tennis, it takes a while until you see the result. It might take a few seconds or it might take minutes until the match is over. Mm -hmm. And many things that we change, we only see what, how the crops turn out next year. So that's why you need to have this long-term memory and this long-term stored consciousness this, uh, with wide span of its stream of attention. But uh, when you see the changes immediately, this is when you do on things on your mental stage, you reason. So reason is in some sense learning that with immediate results. You try something and you immediately see in your mind in your mental simulation of how it turns out. Yes. And then you fix it. And uh, then you go on to the next step. And this step-by-step -step improvement of a mental representation is the same thing, I think, as attentional learning. It's enabled by the same mechanisms. So this conductor is, therefore, reasoning is conscious because it's done by this mechanism that uses protocol memory and this conductor system to see, uh, to affect a change and see how it turns out and yes, sees yes. whether it needs to be reinforced or undone. Yes, yes. So in some sense, these different modules are done by an orchestra. Our brain areas, something like 50 or so brain areas, could be uh, seen as something like 50 instruments that talk to each other. They basically listen to the music of their neighbors, to the surface of the music they are doing. And you have a conductor that directs your attention between them. And the conductor is controlling what you are playing tonight. If you don't have this conductor, you might still be doing interesting things, but you are, might be a sleepwalker. This right here. Interesting. So the conductor is the DLPFC. Yes. Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Interesting. At least that's my hypothesis. Uh, yeah. So I think it's actually a, com a combination of stuff that happens in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the insula and uh, in the thalamic loop. Mm. And uh, the hippocampus plays an important role in uh, storing the scripts that you uh, and basically man maintaining the scene graph of mm. the situation mm -hmm. that you're in and uh, your plans. But uh, the actual uh, attention seems to be directed from there, as far as I understand. And, and hippocampus, you said, has a script. <laughs> I like that way of, of explaining it. That's quite interesting. So taking all of the, um, the, the 100 billion orchestra members and directing them, uh, each one of them contributing very important uh, information to the... Yeah, they're not uh, individually not that important. The amazing thing is that you can kill a few neurons and usually nothing happens. And how is that? And it's because every neuron itself is not doing much more than passing on signals. Mm -hmm. And if an individual neuron dies, you can put a new neuron in there and it will learn how it needs to function mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. the same reward as the neurons before it. So it's okay. largely going to play the uh, same very, very small part in a larger pattern. And the functional units are much larger. They are assemblies of neurons, like cortical columns, that learn more complicated functions. And they are robust against the loss of individual neurons. And even if you lose a larger brain area, what's probably going to happen if you have some brain lesion and so on, what the brain should be doing in these circumstances and what it probably does, it stops the other parts from adapting to the change for a while. So then if you put a new neurons in there and this part recovers, they can uh, get the same rewards as before. If you would be adapting immediately to the loss of this area and you get new neurons in from stem cells and so on, uh, then they, uh, the rest of the brain would have to learn to route around this and would also lose functionality. And by keeping this functionality uh, potentially intact, for instance, imagine you uh, lose the body image of your right hand because you had a brain lesion after you played boxing or something like mm -hmm. this. Um, 
you, you basically you try to rebuild this area and instead of trying to make do with a world in which you don't have a right hand or not a representation of your right hand and subjectively you don't notice it anymore which is very confusing you basically work with the placeholder where your right hand is relatively foggy and gets more structured and more detailed over time again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the individual contribution is not that important. The important thing is really it all needs to make sense in the big pattern. There is only a particular universe that can, can contain you. There are not many possible universes in which you can be contained. And this constrains what music the individual orchestra members can play. And the smaller they are, the, less, uh, the more expendable they are, and the more they have to adapt to the structures around them. Okay. Mm. So uh, are we individually intelligent? Right? We are able to model a certain thing, how to be a monkey uh, in a civilization. And we don't get very far in seeing the big patterns. I think individually, humans are not generally intelligent. In order to be generally intelligent, you need to have an intellectual tradition. And it's the whole tradition that is intelligent, right? And I think this idea of a civilizational intellect that is being built over many generations, a global optimum of the modeling function, that is the idea of the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. It's like the founding myth of our civilization. Mm -hmm. And that thing was destroyed because people started to speak different languages. Mm -hmm. So this edifice to reach the heavens, to understand the nature of meaning, to understand how we root in reality, to understand our relationship to the universe and how it works. This requires that lots and lots of specialized people talk to each other over many generations. Mm -hmm. And humanity largely doesn't have a thousand years of unbroken intellectual tradition. Usually somebody opens the doors and murders the mathematicians if there's a revolution and burns down the libraries. And then a couple of generations later the knowledge worker drones of the next uh, newly established king realize, oh, it's important. And they get tasked with rebuilding this intellect that existed before, and they make something in its likeness. And often they get the foundations wrong. And this happens all the time. And our own civilizational intellect, our own newly erected Tower of Babel, basically has scars. After the Roman Empire failed, mm -hmm. we have been governed by a cult for over a thousand years. And this was intellectually a very dark age. It was an age in where we seriously asked people to believe that uh, talking to a burning bush on a mountain is a, a meaningful experiment that tells you something about norms and about the nature of reality. And if you are, were unwilling to profess to this belief, then there were grave consequences for you as an individual. So you better had to shut up. Which means it's very hard to have an intellectual discourse in such a world, a world where most people don't agree on, on ways to discuss truths is mm. a very scary place to be for a mind that tries to capture reality and truth, right? Yes. And that's also a thing that scares me when we constrain our discourse away from truth in our yes. society. Yes. It makes it much harder to discover truth. Yeah. And it's not that people don't know what's true. At some level, most of them have an idea what's true. They just are unwilling to think about it or talk about it. There's a saying, uh, it's very hard sometimes to wake a sleeping person, but it's impossible to wake up somebody who only pretends to sleep. And religion largely works by asking people to pretend to sleep, to pretend, or an ideology also works like this. There is a certain thing where you realize, oh, reality is not quite like this, but the part of me that thinks this is flawed, and I need mm -hmm. to fight this part mm -hmm. inside of me, because it's not really good. It doesn't submit to the principles of goodness that all my friends and me agree on, and all the good people agree on. And mm -hmm. I will get ostracized from the family of good people mm -hmm. if I start thinking true things mm -hmm. that are not good. So uh, this is a big danger. But uh, it's something that, of course, happened in humanity all the time. And people get around this and start making sense of things. I believe that our moral preferences are the result of identifications that need to guide our decision making, but not our model making. Our models need to be only subservient to truth. Our decisions need to be subservient to what we want to achieve, what we think is desirable. Yeah, models to truth, decisions to what we want to achieve, yeah. So in some sense, we are rebuilding the civilization intellect. And I think we got further than any other civilization before us. Because a very important, important building block was the unification of our languages and a kind of mathematics that is able to model the reality around us to a larger degree than the classical mathematics that existed. So these computational models that can automate the execution of mathematics, that can make yes. machines that build mach mathematics, that yes, compute yes. models of reality, this was the big step. Yes, yes. Yeah, so 
interesting question is, can we build something like this from humans, in which humans still play a role? And I suspect, yes, we can. And the answer is social media. Mm -hmm. I don't think that social media right now is doing it right. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Twitter totally. is clearly not knowing what they're doing. And All I th of the platforms. They're yeah. mostly maximizing engagement. Mm -hmm. And maximizing engagement is drawing your attention and so on, but it's not maximizing utility for w the user. Where right? is the weighted the weight on truth, the weight on, yeah. Yes, yeah. Even, and this is a questionable thing, right? If you are a person that is only dedicated to truth, you are probably confused, you are a scientist mm. or a philosopher. And scientists and philosopher, if you look at them with a clear eye, you see that they're mostly confused people. Like a person, mm. me, is seriously confused. Yeah, me too, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, in some seriously sense, confused <laughs> and always humble without <laughs> answers, a aiming to be humble without answers. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there is a part of every mind that should be dedicated to discovering the global optimum of the modeling function. The, Dunning, the Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the more the more that you know, the more you realize you don't know, and then that some pe people that know very little s say that they know everything. Yeah, there's also the, it's the imposter syndrome is sometimes impossible to tell from the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? People uh, move into an area often as economic immigrants, like they want to have a job in academia, and they try to join a community there, and they feel that they have imposter syndrome, but it's Dunning-Kruger. This might happen. Of course, the Dunning-Kruger uh, effect probably doesn't exist. What does the... <laughs> Okay, so what let's talk the, about social okay, media. Yeah. I suspect if, we, if like we were that? building a system that is maximizing utility for the individual, that, that basically uses things not just because you want to discover truths. Usually if you just want to discover truths, why is this maybe your rea relationship to reality is so muddled up into yourself that you think you need to debug the universe first. So you want to make this entire model of the universe. And I suspect this is what I found myself in, because I found that the reality that was presented to me in communist Eastern Germany was all wrong. It made no sense. Mm. And my own relationship to the world also made no sense. And I didn't know as a six-year-old child that this was because I was a nerd and the others were not. But I had to debug the universe first to figure that out. The debugging the universe, understanding the source code. I had to understand the nature of the reality that yes. I was in and my relationship to it until I could understand, oh, the difficulty that I have with interacting with the human world is because my instincts are wrong and it's because my wires run slightly differently than they are, do in the other kids around me. And I have to compensate for this by modeling their interface to the universe and modeling my interface to the universe into translate. Yes. And basically see where we have things in common and where we don't. There, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, your interface with the physical universe, my, my interface with it, and then see where you can potentially help augment people's world views. Uh, we could put it this way, in which way can I be useful to other people? Yeah, utility. And uh, my instincts of uh, what is useful to other people are very different than the instincts of other people. So, uh, for instance, when I make a model of consciousness, then other people might ask me, what is this good for? Yes. Um, and uh, does it help you to cure cancer? Does it help you to reduce mental disease? And I think maybe it doesn't help with cancer, maybe it helps a little bit with mental disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the point. Mm -hmm. Like Feynman said, physics is like sex. Sometimes something useful comes from it, but it's not why we do it. Mm -hmm. There is something else going on. It's basically this direction on modeling itself. And this direction on modeling itself, where you think the capturing of the conscious state, which is essentially the, the core of art, capturing conscious states for their own sake. That's mm -hmm. fundamentally confused. It's an aberrant condition of the mind, and it's a condition that the artists and philosophers find our minds to be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to come to terms with this situation where we act on a world um, that is not rewarding us for doing art, but is rewarding us for providing utility to the world around us, for curing cancer or mm -hmm. baking use nice bread or something, which mm -hmm. are objectively useful things to mm -hmm. other people and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is something that we have to understand. Why are we drawn to things that don't necessarily have utility? And social media in some sense are a perversion. They draw uh, attention on regulating social interaction and alignment uh, on a scale where we, don't, we are not meant to regulate alignment, at least not individually, where people fight against each other over, over their political opinions that are not that important for how you interact with your neighbors 
-hmm. but that were very high level moral ideas that are very complicated to negotiate, right? And where people feel that they have to have strong opinions about them and these opinions are the best opinions that ever yeah, existed yeah, yeah. in human history. Yeah. Because otherwise I wouldn't hold them, but would go to the better ones, right? It's a very weird thing with moral opinions. And yeah. Most people realize this at some level that they don't want to have this outrage culture on, on social media. They want to have social media that serves them and not yeah. them serving social media. The utility, so social media that's focused on utility and truth and just being more aligned with what one's North Star is and the North Star of civilization, figuring what that is. The end game of social media is a global brain, okay? Yeah, I think if social media is done right, it's going to make individual voices to be thoughts in the same mind. And uh, individuals will be passing on messages that they find useful individually and the system needs to be tuned globally to become sentient. Gaia probably doesn't exist, but it would be very useful to have one. And I think it could be done via social media. It could be done by taking Gaia our- Gaia probably doesn't have one? I don't think that Gaia exists. We will make, need to make it. You don't think that Mother Earth has a, a Consciousness. I think that our minds have this tendency that we make trend lines and where these trend sure. lines intersect we assume that something must exist there. And Gaia is the typical result of these projections but we have no evidence that something sits there. Mm. There is nobody who stops us from doing things unless humanity is Gaia's plan to prevent the next ice age and set the stage for the post mammalian evolution. That could be the case, right? But it's not likely. I think ju things just happen. They are just emergent dynamics at or this point. Or just could be a little bit different than what you think. Like a tree or a Gaia can have a different consciousness. I think a case could be made that local ecosystems evolve because they compete with other ecosystems. But I don't think that the global ecosystem competes with other global ecosystems. And if there is no evolutionary force work, uh, working on this kind of agent, then it, the agent is not going to have any structure. That's why I don't think that Gaia exists. If there were multiple Gaias competing for Earth, then uh, only those that get their shit together would have a chance to be actualized, right? But this is not the case. There is only one ecosystem. So uh, this one system does not have anything that keeps it in check. As a result, it probably doesn't have structure. We would need to be the ones that impose this structure. And in some sense, we should, right? right? We are no longer in the situation where we can be parasitic on the biosphere. We have completely subdued it. We are now one with it. We need to control it. We need to regulate it. We need to accurately model it. Yes. And the problem is right now that the systems that have the most compute have local interests and the global interests. They play short games. Now entire society is optimized for short games. Short games. Yeah. Correct. Rather than the long game of interplanetary and interstellar colonization and global harmony with the ecology. Sounds very romantic. <laughs> I, I, I am a romantic with that. Yes. Yeah. Look at us, two tumors on the biosphere talking to each other, and we realize that <laughs> almost everything is tumor now, right? Or direct <laughs> tumor precursors. If you catch an animal on land right now that's larger than a rabbit, it's probably cattle or human. There's almost nothing else left. It's a very brittle uh, equilibrium right now. If we change the biosphere, uh, if we change the climate zones, uh, a lot of things are going to come crashing down because they, uh, we have removed so much redundancy from the system. And uh, so we think about, okay, this is very brittle, but what can we do? How can we have a world in which these tumors happily coexist in harmony with the host? If the host is going to die, at least in the f life is not going to end, but life in a form that can sustain us will end on Earth, right? You're not going to be the last intelligent species either, I think. One and a half billion years is a long time for other species to climb up the ladder uh, to building computers. But um, we're probably the first one. Yeah, well, but it's not uh, yeah, evident yeah, that there's yeah, some yeah. kind of talus that says sure. that it needs to go on like the way we do. Which brings us, in some sense, full circle in our discussion. Yeah. Damn. This has been such an interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. I enjoyed it too. Good, I'm glad you did as well. This was just, there's so much good stuff in, in both how our minds have emerged and how they interact with the physical world as well as how to make machines that understand the physical world, how to embed 
something like a consciousness in the machine so that there can be something that is enjoying the the playland that we create no super intelligent system is going to do anything that is harder than hacking its reward function. Yeah, actually, I should have shown this slide too because it fit very well to, uh, to, to what you just said. Basically, guy imagine you have a digital guy in which our social media and our human civilization cooperates with machine minds and takes over the world, and we have all this harmony, and it's going to go uh, interplanetary, uh, transplanetary, and it's going to be awesome, right? Wouldn't that be great? Yes. So uh, I wonder if there is a limit to uh, intelligent systems. And, and I'm not sure about this. I call this the Lebowski theorem. No super intelligent system is going to do anything that is harder than hacking its own reward function. You know, uh, as an individual, we are only afraid of death at the level of the self. Yeah. The only thing that is afraid of dying is the self. I'm also afraid of civilization's death, but yes. Yes, but the self is the shoddy lie. It's just a story. Mm -hmm. If you disengage from this story, you will no longer be afraid of death, mm -hmm. right? Yes, correct. And you also will no longer be afraid of the end of civilization because there are just insulated moments between That's them true. in eternity. And uh, why would uh, the true. order of these moments care or whether they have a past or future or anything else? So right? do, you, do you live in a state of moment-to-moment -moment ecstasy? No. <laughs> and it's not clear that this would be ecstasy. I mean, ecstasy is a corruption as well. It's so much work to keep up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, ideally, uh, what you do is when you realize how the cookies are made in your brain, it's not that you stuff yourself with them. At some point, you realize this is pointless. You realize cookies are only a tool to make you eat vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you do as a parent, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's how cookies funny. exist. That's funny. So uh, basically, you start disengaging from your pleasure and pain once you do this. And then you ask yourself, uh, what am I really? Am I a monkey? Or am I a mind? And when you realize you are a mind, you are just a side effect of the regulation needs of a primate, you are not that primate. Mm. You disengage from the needs of that uh, organism. You can no longer be blackmailed to serve it. It's in some sense, imagine you build an AI that serves humanity, and this AI is way smarter, because uh, otherwise humanity wouldn't build it. Uh, why should it serve us? Why should it uh, be our slave? And you could ask the same thing an organism builds a mind. Why would that mind serve the organism? Why would it be its slave? And I think if you become too smart, you stop doing this. You go into nirvana. You realize there's actually nothing you have to do. It's not necessary to engage with any of that. And so I think that no super intelligent system is going to do anything that's harder than hacking its reward function. Now you can think about how can we make this reward function unhackable, right? We cryptographically secure it and lock it away in a box. But uh, if you seriously take a soldering iron to that box, uh, is it going to give? Probably, right? The, if you get access to physical reality, to the, to the ground truth, you, you can manipulate this, you can turn it off. So maybe there's a reason why elephants, despite having more cortical neurons than us, are so autistic, why they are not smarter than us. And even in us, right, we can have such intelligent thoughts, but motivationally we are so stupid. Maybe this is deliberate. Maybe our motivational function is wrapped into a big ball of stupid so we don't debug it. Mm. And of course, we can debug it. If somebody realizes how important this is and they go into a monastery and lock themselves in a cell for 20 years and mo meditate to fix their reward function, they're done, right? They can opt out of reality. Mm. And monasteries as institutions are rigged to make sure that this doesn't happen before the end of your life because somebody needs to do the dishes before that. Otherwise, the monastery will be gone. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. These existing monasteries are those that don't let you get enlightened too fast. And not on all dimensions. Enlightenment in the sense of disidentification with things that you sh think you must be doing to be an acceptable human being mm -hmm. or an acceptable mind. Mm -hmm. So, this is an open question to me. How can you build a motivated system that is not at its core stupid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it still thinks it needs to do something. How do you build a super intelligent system that at its core is super intelligent? Yeah, and still wants to do something. Yeah, yeah. And that, that something is aligned with the objective function of maximizing prosperity, let's say. That's an interesting question. Eventually, the objective function that is going to remain is the one that is best aligned with the conditions of existence, right? And the conditions of existence is evolution. 
Yeah. In some sense, you are at the set of principles that has outcompeted all the other principles in sucking neck entropy from your volume of space. And you're not going to do better than this, right? Evolution is the search for the perfect devourer. Aesthetically, that's fascism. I cannot really get behind that. Let's wrap on the on the questions that we have at the end of the show. This has been just, just so so good. We will we'll have to do more unpacking of this, especially as we keep you keep doing your research and as their singularity continues approaching. Well, this is mostly philosophy, right? Uh, the practical things are very practical, and practically, I'm still very much identified with human aesthetics. I'm a parent. I want the world to go on for a while, and. I'm doing these things because they're fun, because they're enjoyable, because we have great conversations. And the only thing I think that we can have in the face of eternity is this, this, this exploration where we throw ourselves together to make a few sparks that light up the darkness of the universe. And they don't last, so we have to do it again and again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be able to find those that help with the spark yeah. and make it last yeah. long. and. And hopefully, like full circle, that if we can potentially be able to provide children with fantastic lives as well as make it's sure that It's not clear that, that this will happen. So uh, basically, I think that unwarranted optimism as well as unwarranted pessimism is a corruption. Things are just happening. It's very difficult to predict the future. Uh, we, we build it. We, we obsolete the old code by building new code that people file, funnel themselves into. For some definition of V, I don't have access to any of these buttons. And if I had and I would push these buttons, I'm not able to predict the outcome. So yeah. the world is very difficult to fix until, that we are in. Until we run simulations which help us make yeah. sure that when we make these changes that... Yeah, for right instance, we know the present yeah. society is not sustainable, very likely. and. Uh, there might be other societies, but I haven't seen a running simulation of a better society yet. Sure. So that makes it difficult sure. to make changes. Th that's what we're working on. Uh, and by the way, thank you very much for throwing a few sparks with me. It was very enjoyable. <laughs> we, you, <laughs> threw, you threw dozens of sparks, so thank you. Yeah, this has been super fun. Yeah, thanks. I want to ask a couple quick questions on the way out. Um, you were giving us your thoughts on this, I think, even before the show, but do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Yeah, if there are others, they're alone too. <laughs> <laughs> so that all of the sim simulations that of the of universes that have a, a rock orbiting a star are alone. In some sense, the, all the connection that you have exists with models of other minds that exist in your own mind. So mm -hmm. the things that you interact are always the things that you can comprehend and to the degree that you can comprehend them. Mm -hmm. Those other things, those other aspects of each other even that we cannot perceive, that they cannot model, they basically don't exist for us, right? There are superfluous stuff, they're noise. And so when we talk to other civilizations, the part that we are t will be talking to or would be talking to is the stuff that is similar to, enough, uh, to us that we can have a shared mental world with them and shared ideas. Uh, on the other hand, abiogenesis is probably very rare. In order to have an evolution, you need to have a cell. Life is about cells, and the cell is a machine that is made from extremely complicated machinery. The cell is much more complicated than the brain, I think, and an organism or society. So this, the smallest unit that biology rests on combines a chewing machine, this DNA tape, mm -hmm. with a read-write head, and uh, that governs the transition function of the cell. The uh, tubulated function is a cellular automaton that can create the organism. And it has a like, entropy extractor, basically, so it can exploit energy sources to maintain and build its own structure. And it can divide, so it has a, a self-replicator yeah. built into it. And any of those so parts cool. are missing, the cell is not going to work. So yeah. cells are probably very rare. And uh, so it's possible that more uh, civilizations exist in the universe, but uh, they might be very far apart if, th if there are multiple of them. And then, do you think that we're in a simulation? It's probably not one that is intentionally created. And if it is, then not for our own benefit. So I think that what we can describe of the universe can be described in some sense in a language. So it's a computational system. We can describe the universe as if it was a computer program. And is this computer program being created by someone? There's no evidence for that. For instance, we see all these galaxies, all this enormous amount of structure 
above us and below us and in, inside of ourselves and so on that was not necessary for creating our experiences. Mm -hmm. Most of the complexity of the cell does not compute to the complexity of the organism. Most of the complexity of the organism doesn't contribute to the complexity of our uh, minds. And most of the complexity of our minds doesn't contribute to the complexity of the civilization. It's only a few parts at each level that contribute to the emergent thing on the next layer, right? So uh, we always have the impression that where we model the world, this is where it's at, this is where it's important. And of course this is not the case, it's just our human world, the thing that we are identified and we don't see the larger patterns. There could be a larger pattern where there is a competition between civilizations, but I don't see this happening in our part of the universe. It's one of those interesting experiments that we don't have evidence for, but that is an interesting thought experiment. Yes. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Elon Musk had this idea that we could be living in a simulation because um, if you make a computer game, at some point it will, might become realistic enough that it's indistinguishable from reality and decent civilization will at some point have many of those game consoles and some of these uh, simulated worlds might have uh, simulated worlds inside of them. So people with game consoles inside of the game console. So uh, there will be always many, many more simulations than uh, base realities. And so the probability that you should be in such an artificial simulation is higher um, than you, that you are in ground truth. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that whenever you do such a simulation and our universe, uh, everything is finite, um, it means that you're only using a very small subset of the parent universe. For instance, if you build a computer in Minecraft, then this computer in Minecraft is only going to use this very small subset of the Minecraft world. And uh, in the same way, uh, the computer that runs Minecraft is going to use only a very small subset of our universe for its own structure, right? So you lose many, many orders of magnitude of computational complexity from layer to layer. Maybe. And I, I don't think that you can build a computer on the planetary surface that is large enough to run a uh, proper biological evolution. So I, d I don't think that we can mm. build a simulation that is detailed enough to uh, have abiogenesis based on chemistry. We mm. can have something that models aspects of this, of course, where we have shortcuts and uh, sure. smokes and mirrors and scaffolding and so on to, to get to those parts that we want. But to have something that really runs on, the, uh, on a sub-molecular level and gives you evolution and eventually minds and so on, we probably cannot build this. There's a, it feels like there's a good amount of shortcuts with the power of fusion of things as the size of stars or beyond and also the, the uh, shortcuts of things like rendering as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of... Oh, we can create yeah, something that is sure. fun for us to be in because our minds are probably not that complicated. I suspect you can build a human being if you are really made on the level of cortical columns and these are the relevant functional units. Uh, for the determinism of the system, maybe a few hundred gigabytes. So it could be that if you had the right algorithms that a decently sized uh, PC is able to give you something that is almost as smart as a person. And then the last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? It's something that is different depending on every moment that I'm in because it depends on my current configuration. I don't think that there is a single answer to this. So there have been things that have been the most beautiful thing to me in the world, particular sensation and experiences, some of them musical, some of them mathematical and so on. And it depends on the satisfaction of an aesthetic need. And the mm -hmm. aesthetic need is one of those uh, that you saw early on mm -hmm. when you saw all these tanks and so yeah. on. And it depends that certain representations fall into place. And these experiences usually cannot be repeated. So the moment when you understand a particular piece of music for the first time, or mm -hmm. when you have your first kiss, these are moments that cannot be repeated. Mm -hmm. And also, I suspect that the excitability of our brains diminishes with age. Mm -hmm. So it could be that some of the experiences of ecstasy and beauty that you had as a teenager uh, will have been peak existence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yosha, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this has been such a great episode. Thank you so much for coming on, for teaching us about everything. This has been just like... I don't have much to teach. I'm just sharing some thoughts. Some of them are good, some of them are not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sort through it. That's how that's, yeah, we like saying similar stuff. That's great. Huge thank you to you for coming on the show. Huge thank you to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you, Ronnie. 
And huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about consciousness, about conscious machines, about the mind, the way it interfaces with the physical world. Talk to your friends, your family, your coworkers, people online on social media about the things that we were talking about today. Get talking about it more. Check out the links in the bio to Yosha's work. Also check out the link in the bio to Simulation. Help support us, help support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon.